Welcome to another podcast from School of Surgery. Uh, today we're going to talk again to Dr. Brett Dolman uh, about systematic reviews and meta-analyses. There is a, a longer version of this podcast um, which tells you everything you need to know about systematic reviews and meta-analysis and the reasons why and the background to things, which is well worth listen. But this is the, the condensed version so that you can sit with uh, one of these papers and be able to interpret it quickly and uh, accurately. So um, thanks again for coming, Brett. Hello. Hello. So as Mr. Lund said, we've got a longer version of this presentation, but this is just a quick summary so you can quickly, critically appraise systematic reviews and, and meta-analyses. So the first thing I want to discuss is something related to the searches in the meta-analyses that you read in. And this is that when authors look for particular studies and decide whether to include or exclude these studies, what you want to make sure is that it's done independently by two different authors. Now this reduces authors cherry picking studies on the basis of what they think are, are good studies or what fit in with their view of how a, a particular intervention should work and this helps reduce this reviewer selection bias. Also with the searches you need to ensure that the systematic review or meta-analysis has looked at a variety of, of sources from which to select their studies. So you want searches of lots of different electronic databases as well as searches of unpublished clinical trial databases as well as searches of things like conference proceedings. So there's a wide range of sources sought and that no studies are excluded because, for example, they're published in, in lower quality journals. So the old adage is that any meta-analysis is only as good as the randomised controlled trials that it includes. And this is where we come to the next aspect, which is risk of bias. So this is typically assessed, the gold standard being the Cochrane risk of bias tool. And this allocates different domains of internal validity scores. So it will assign low risk studies, and usually that's depicted with a green symbol, unclear risk studies where there's not enough information there to make a judgment or high risk of bias for any particular domain which is usually depicted with red on a summary chart. Now these domains include randomization, so was the randomization list generated in an appropriate way such as using a computer program? Could the people conducting the study determine which the next which group the next participant is going to be allocated to and, and this in previous studies has been shown to um, massively increase bias within studies. Blinding is important so whether the participants themselves whether the investigators or indeed whether the people conducting the outcome assessment were blinded to which intervention the, the patient had received. Attrition bias relates to Differential dropouts in each of the groups, which can bias any particular result from a study. Selective outcome reporting is to do with whether the authors had pre-reported all of their um, outcomes that they'd specified in a, a clinical trial protocol. And other bias, which might include baseline imbalances, as well as whether the study was funded by, say, a pharmaceutical company, which may affect results. So the, what you're looking for in the paper that you're reading is that there has been a proper assessment of the bias, which is mentioned in the methods and in the results. So you're looking for the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool or similar being said in the methods and also that results where there's a that traffic light uh, diagram next to the studies. Yes, that's correct. And there's a, a shift away from using composite scores such as the JADAD score, which is quite a famous one that's used, but there's many reasons why they're not really appropriate, so ideally you want them to use the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. Okay, we've just got an example here where we can see on the, the left-hand side we've got a meta-analysis here with a variety of studies, and you can see that a lot of the domains have been allocated as high risk of bias, so immediately your vision's caught to this chart and it indicates that the studies that are included within that meta-analysis are at high risk of bias, and therefore the overall results from the meta-analysis may well be biased. The right hand figure, this depicts a selection of studies with relatively low risk and unclear risk of bias. So you can see instantly there's a visual depiction of the studies within that meta-analysis and you get an idea that they're generally low risk of bias studies. So heterogeneity is important. So clinical heterogeneity you can determine from usually the table of 
studies that are included within the meta-analysis. So what you want to do is you want to look at whether the studies were similar enough that combining them in a meta-analysis was an appropriate thing to do. For example, some people might argue that if you're looking at post-operative pain trials to include all types of surgery may not be an appropriate way to, to gather the results and, and this can be easily identified from the characteristics of the studies. Statistical heterogeneity results from studies results differing by more than would be expected by sampling error and this is usually expressed using the i square statistic where it goes from 1 to 100% and any result generally above 50% you would be concerned that the results from each of the individual studies differ by more than would be expected by chance. And this reduces confidence that we can have in the results. So if there's a high level of heterogeneity, you would be concerned that the results vary by quite a large degree and you can have less confidence in the results. Yeah. So over 50% on the I-squared interpret with caution? I think so. As, as, a, as an easy rule, I think it's, yeah. it's best to apply that. And you also want to check whether heterogeneity has been investigated, which is absolutely essential, because things like dose of the intervention might alter how it works and you want to make sure that they've done this either by subgroup analysis or meta regression which you can find in our other presentation. So we've just got an example here of a forest plot which we discussed in our previous presentation and we can see at the bottom that the results on this side of the chart the confidence intervals for each of the individual studies vary by quite a lot and they don't overlap by much and this is reflected in the high I squared value at the bottom of the chart of 79%. So there we can see there's a high degree of statistical heterogeneity and therefore we lose confidence in how precise the results are. We have another example here of one where confidence intervals overlap a bit more and we can see that this is reflected in a low I squared value of 0%. Therefore we can have more confidence that these results don't vary by more than would be expected by chance. So, and apart from looking at the I squared, you can see from the forest plot itself because uh, those the, the centres of those uh, the, those branches uh, stack up one on top of each other very nicely, which is a, a good visual way of, of of seeing the same thing quickly. Is that right? Exactly. So you can use both the confidence intervals from the forest plot and the I squared to determine whether there's mm. evidence of statistical so heterogeneity. All the boxes in a line above the lozenge is a good sign. Yeah. yeah. So publication bias we've discussed in a bit more depth in the previous presentation, but basically it relates to the fact that statistically significant results get published m faster and are more likely to be published than negative results, which creates bias within the literature. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that the study has, I mean, the most important aspect is to try and prevent publication bias. And this is achieved by searching clinical trial databases for unpublished studies, as well as other unpublished studies such as conference proceedings. And they might want to look at grey literature databases as well. And that's a good way to help reduce publication bias and is the most important thing that a review can do. But having done that as well, they need to see whether there's actually publication bias within their particular meta-analysis. And the ways that this can be done is by funnel plots, which we'll see an example of, or you can use quantitative tests such as Eggers linear regression tests, which will give you a p-value, which will indicate whether there's a likelihood of publication bias being present or not. So there's two things, aren't there? There's, there's where the search hasn't been adequate, and so you can pick that from the methods that make they've done everything, or that there may have just been things not published. And this is one of the problems with drug-sponsored, drug company-sponsored drug company -sponsored, uh, trials that negative results just don't get published. So there's two reasons for having uh, this kind of publication bias. Yes, so again, you want to make sure they've done this wide range in search, but even that can't completely avoid publication bias, which mm -hmm. is why they still need to use methods to try and detect yeah. it. So we can see an example here of a funnel plot where you've got the y-axis, which is usually some measure of precision here. It's the standard error on a reverse scale, and you've got your effect estimate at the bottom. And what you'll want to see is a nice even inverted funnel and this indicates that there's unlikely to be publication bias present in this meta-analysis. We have another example here where we can see the same y and x scale but we can see that on the one side the funnel plot appears asymmetrical 
And what this does is this indicates that there may be a whole bunch of studies on the other side of the plot that haven't been published simply because they were negative. And we can see the miss where the missing studies are on the right hand side of the plot. So another thing to discuss is you want to be looking at precision and error. And precision really relates to how narrow your confidence intervals are. So if the results of the particular meta-analysis have got very wide confidence intervals, that means it can possibly include quite a range of population effects and therefore it decreases the certainty you can have in those results. You also want to be looking at the effect estimate, whatever that is in the meta-analysis, and see whether that's clinically significant. So, for example, in meta-analyses of post-operative pain, you'd be wanting to look for pain score reductions of a clinically significant level, and that you can derive from other research within the field. There's another aspect of this as well, is looking at error. So, in the same way that you can get type 1 and type 2 errors in primary studies, you can get these in meta-analyses as well. So type 1 error would be finding a statistically significant result when one in fact doesn't exist, or a type 2 error is where you don't find a statistically significant result when one actually exists. And this can be done using a kind of advanced form of analysis which is creeping into the meta-analysis literature, which is something called trial sequential analysis. And essentially what this does is it's a bit like having a post hoc sample size calculation, and this can help avoid both type 1 and type 2 errors in meta-analyses. So in really good recent meta-analyses, it should do a trial sequential analysis. Yeah, that's a, it's a bit of a modern thing, and it's quite an advanced analysis, but you want to be looking to see whether they've performed that, especially in meta-analyses that include a low number of studies, mm. because they're at particular risk of type 1 and type 2 errors, and therefore trial sequential analysis is essential. So in summary, we've looked at some of the most important aspects of a meta-analysis to determine whether it's been performed well. So we've looked at reviewer selection bias, which should be done independently by two authors. We've looked at selection bias, including a wide range insert strategy. We've looked at risk of bias in the included trials. And important to remember that even if a meta-analysis is conducted to the highest methodological standards, it's only ever as good as the trials it includes. We discussed a bit about heterogeneity, both clinical and statistical, and made sure that meta-analyses explore this if it's present. We've also discussed publication bias, looking at funnel plots, and we've also had a discussion about precision and error, and specifically trial sequential analysis. And just to finish on a particular note, because it's something that often causes confusion with people who both perform meta-analyses and read them, in that which model to choose, the random effects model or the fixed effects model. Now, they're both quite complex to discuss their underlying assumptions, but just as a general rule, that the fixed effects analysis, the assumptions behind that are, are rarely satisfied within a meta-analysis. So ideally, they want to be performing a, a random effects analysis, and that's just a, a simple and easy rule for people um, who are not experienced with meta-analysis who are reading um, that just to make that judgment. Great. Well, that's that's uh, really clear. Thanks very much, Brett. So that's made quite a complex area looking at meta-analysis uh, very understandable. So we've got a stepwise approach to breaking down uh, in analysis and interpretation of these. So don't believe what you read just by looking at the lozenge. Have a look a little bit deeper and then decide whether you're going to believe the findings of the meta-analysis before you take it as gospel. OK, well, thanks again, Brett Dolman. Thank you for listening to another podcast brought to you by School of Surgery. Remember you can follow us on Facebook at School of Surgery, on iTunes, on Podomatic at schoolofsurgery.podomatic.com and finally by searching School of Surgery on YouTube. Thank you very much and see you next time.